To Know Christ, a television ministry of the Lutheran Church of Peace in Platteville, Wisconsin. Here's your host, Rev. Jeff Peterson. Well, today's lesson is entitled, The Means of Grace. The Means of Grace. And so as we begin, I want to read from John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And so I think, what a wonderful Bible passage. These couple of verses to start off the study today as we think about grace. You know, what is grace? Well, we may say, well, that ice skater sure is a graceful skater. Or I knew a gal whose name was Grace. And I'd have to say that she was a wonderful, wor- a wonderful woman. But when we think about grace as being a word, a word that is used in, in Christianity, a good way to remember this word would be if you're to use the word grace as an acronym, God's riches at Christ's expense. And so whenever we hear the word grace, grace means that somebody is doing something for us. Something that we cannot earn. It's not like we deserve it. We can't purchase it. Rather, somebody is doing something for us or giving something to us as a free gift. And the basis of that free gift is love. Now, I know that a lot of times we go through life saying, well, what do you mean grace? Everything that I have, and I may not have a whole lot, but I have earned it. I have earned it with a lot of hard work, with a lot of good thinking. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to all that I have. Well, and there's a lot of truth to going out and working hard and saying that I did work hard in order to have some of the things that I have in life. But still, we rely on grace. We rely on God's grace every day. The sunshine. Do you deserve the sun to shine upon you this day? Or how about the rain? Is that something that you have earned? Or how about the very air that we breathe? Did you purchase it? Isn't it a good thing that all of these come to us as a gift of God's grace? The most important things are the things that God has given to us because there's no price tag on them. If we had to purchase sunshine, if we had to purchase rain, if we had to purchase the air that we breathe, we, if there was a price tag on that, none of us could afford it. And so we are thankful that it comes to us as a gift. And so I read from Romans uh, chapter 3, verses 22 through 24. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ. To all who believe, there is no difference For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. And so we hear words here. We hear hear words like righteousness, justification. 
redemption, grace. And so I've talked a little bit about grace, but there is also the word justification. Justification is a legal term. And here again, just like grace, you can use it as an acronym, so I'll remember grace by saying God's riches at Christ's expense. Well, justification is a legal term. It means that we are guilty. It means that we really are the ones that are to pay the penalty for our wrongdoings, for our sins. And so it would be as if we were standing before the judge. And the judge, instead of sentencing us, saying, well, you've got to go to prison now for the rest of your life, saying, I declare you not guilty. And so as I read in there, it says, For all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of our sin is death. That we are justified, declared not guilty. And so, like I mentioned, how we can remember the word grace, how we can remember the word justified is that in Christ, justified is just as if we had never sinned. That is the freedom and the release that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus dies in our place. And that is the just penalty for our redemption now in order to be saved. Because we cannot save ourselves. It comes as a free gift of God's grace in Jesus Christ. And so we also hear in there the word redemption. Redemption, meaning to redeem. You know, something that, was, something that has value. But then all of a sudden it loses its value. But now it has its value again. And so you think about redemption. You know, I think of a pop can. A pop can that we purchase full of the contents that we are wanting, well, that pop can is going to be very valuable to us because as we open it up, we can drink its contents. But after that can has been emptied of its contents, we'd say now this can is of no value anymore. But now with all the good efforts of trying to take care of the environment and renewing our resources and not wasting our resources, we come up with recycling to say that this can is very valuable. As far as the aluminum, we can use it again, and so now it's valuable again, and that, there are, that there's somebody who's willing to purchase that can, giving that can value again. And so as far as humanity, God created us good, great value, but because of sin, we have lost that value. We are now depraved. But Jesus Christ dies for our sins so that God no longer sees us as being value, valueless, but rather saying, you are of the greatest value. You are of the greatest worth. You are my child. You have been redeemed. Now, here again, as we think about ourselves as people, it's like, I can't just say, well, you know, my right arm is a sinful arm, and... Because of my right arm, I am now guilty. And it's too bad. If I could only just cut my right arm off, then the rest of my body is, well, it's A-OK. -okay. But that's not... And so some ways I, I think about that as if I'm driving my car and I'm in an accident and just a part of the car has been damaged, do I throw the whole car away because only part of it has been damaged? We could say, well, this damaged car is really worthless, but if we take it to, to a body shop, there's somebody that will work on that car and will make it look like it's new again. That the car has been restored, it's been redeemed. And so I think about people who go to prison while well, they've done one terrible thing in their life, 
And now they've got to, but that kind of disqualifies the whole person. It's like, well, my right arm sinned, and so now my whole person has to go into jail now, has to go into prison. But the thing about it is, is that as, as sinners, is that our whole person has been disqualified. But it is Jesus who redeems our whole person. And that's what God wants to see in all people is that how do we, you know, he wants to redeem our lives. And we too must be in that work of redemption. How do we help people to redeem their lives? I've known so many wonderful people where they've gone out and they've done something wrong. And now because of that, going out and doing something wrong, they're in all kinds of trouble. They're now suffering the consequences of it. And my prayer is always for that person. Lord, I just pray that you can redeem this person's life and if there's anything that I can do, if I can be part of this process of, rede of redemption, helping this person get back onto life's track again and a life of righteousness, Lord, I want to be part of that. But it is Jesus who makes us righteous. And so this is all grace. The gift, like I mentioned, all these things about grace as far as the sunshine, the rain, the air that we breathe. Even, you know, check your pulse. Feel your heartbeat. That's grace. But now, as I read from Romans chapter 3, that we see that the salvation life of God comes to us as a free gift in our Lord Jesus Christ. We are saved not because we deserve it, not because we have earned it, or not that because we have purchased it, or not because I was born into a certain family, or a race of people, or I belong to a certain nation, or because I've got the right thinking, or some method of belief, but no, saved by God's grace. And having faith to believe in the trust in what God has done for me in Jesus Christ, to receive, to cling on to that grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And ultimately, that's what faith is. It's trusting in what God has done. Okay, so I read from John three sixteen and 17, saying, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And I read from Romans chapter 3, you know, that salvation comes as a gift of our Lord Jesus and Jesus Christ has died on the cross for our sins and has arisen from the dead. And it's through him that we have salvation. But we may ask, but how do we receive this salvation? Jesus is risen from the dead. How do I receive this salvation life? Well, that's where we come into the means of God's grace. How do we receive it in faith to say that I know that God's grace that the salvation of our Lord Jesus Christ has come upon me this day like the sun may shine upon me in this day as well. Or maybe it's a rainy day and so we are being graced with God's rain from heaven. Well, the one way is through the word of God. Hearing the word of God. Now we read in John chapter 1, verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Okay, and so in the beginning was the Word. Okay, now the Greek word for word is logos. And that's a Greek word, and what logos means is that it's the origin of all things. It's the origin of creation. It's the origin of logic and thinking, of intelligence of understanding. So in other words, whoever the logo says, that's God. Okay, and so John is making his argument saying is that Jesus is the logo. So Jesus is God come into this world, flesh, and dwells among us. That Jesus is God as a human come into this world. And so just like we've been talking, that 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The Apostle Paul writes that we are justified, that we are saved through our Lord Jesus Christ as a free gift of God's grace. And so the Word, the Word comes to us in three ways. The Bible, from cover to cover. It's the message of the Word, of Jesus. All right, a lot of you are probably saying, well, the Old Testament, that was before Jesus. No, it's about Jesus. Remember, Jesus, he's always been. And so we read about Jesus in the Old Testament all as a preparation for his coming. We read, for instance, Psalm 23, where Jesus, is, or where they talk about the Lord is my shepherd, and, and so many of you probably know that psalm, but really, who is the good shepherd? The good shepherd is Jesus. Or as we read the psalm before that, Psalm 22, where we hear the words, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus quoted this from the cross. And as we read Psalm 22, I mean, in a very, in a very graphic way, it's describing a person who's being crucified. And so, who is Psalm 22 all about? It's about Jesus. Or as we read from Deuteronomy, for instance, chapter 18, verse 15, where Moses is saying is that there's going to be one coming about, a prophet, that you must listen to him who's going to come and fulfill all of the law of God. And so who's Moses talking about? Jesus. And then, so, then all the people of the Bible, the stories, I mean, these are all prototypes. These are all kind of the, the precursors of, of who Jesus is going to be and what he's going to do. When you look at the story of Noah and the ark, you're probably familiar with that story. You know, the world becomes so depraved and unrighteous and, and so full of evil. And so God takes the most righteous person, and that is Noah. And he sees Noah and his family and all the animals, puts them on, and he's, he's now on the ark, and saving them over the tumultuous waters of sin, death, and the devil to eternal life. Well, who, who does Noah represent? Jesus. Or how about Moses? As God's people are slaves in Egypt. Well, he leads them through the Red Sea and through the wilderness to the Promised Land. Well, who's the one who saves us from the bondages of sin, death, and the power of the devil and where we are baptized and we are wandering in this wilderness of life and one day we're going to cross, in a sense, the Jordan River of death into eternal life. Well, who is our Mo who, who's our Moses? It's Jesus. And I could go on and on with all the stories and the scriptures. I mean, we could read, for instance, Isaiah chapter 53 and, and talks about prophesying about a man who's going to be suffering and dying on a cross and who's beaten. Well, who is, who is this person? It's Jesus. Okay, so the Bible from cover to cover is the message of God's word. It's the message of Jesus. But then there's the living word, and the living word is when Jesus comes into this world and lives among us full of grace and truth. There are four books of the Bible, the four first books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And those books are there to tell us about the life of Jesus as the living word who has become flesh and who's dwelt among us now. And it's the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that write this to share the story that prophecy has been fulfilled, that the law has been fulfilled, and that Jesus has taught us about the kingdom of heaven that he's now established in this world, in the church. He's given us prophecy concerning the end times, but then the promises of eternal life. So Jesus being the living word, but Jesus, who suffered and died on the cross and has arisen from the dead, he ascended back into heaven. And so the rest of the New Testament books you know, share about how the Holy Spirit comes and how the Holy Spirit forms the church. And God's teaching as far as how we are to respond to the word 
the living word of Jesus and how we are to live as Christians. But then there's also the preached word, the preached word of God. And the preached word of God, as we think about Romans chapter 10, is that this is the preacher, the pastor, or whomever is preaching the word of God, that as the word of God is being preached, that it is faith is being stirred up in their hearing. And so I read from John chapter 10, uh, verses uh, 5 through 9. Excuse me, Romans chapter 10, uh, verses 5 through 9. Moses describes in this way the righteousness that is by the law. The man who does these things will live by them, but the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart, Who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith we are proclaiming. That if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And so what, and then I'll also read verse 17. I think that's very important. So consequently, faith comes from hearing the message, and hearing the message is heard through the word of Christ. And so, as you hear the preacher preaching the word of God, the Holy Spirit is convicting you of this, to say, I believe, I believe that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. Salvation life has come to me. And so, that's one of the means of God's grace, is the word of God that comes to us. A second means of grace is that of baptism. Yeah, I say baptism. You know, John the Baptist, or excuse me, as we read in the Gospel of John, uh, John chapter 3, uh, verses 1 through 7, we hear the story about Nicodemus. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the Spirit gives birth to Spirit. You should not be surprised by, at my sayings. You cannot be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, and you cannot tell where it comes from and where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit." And so what Jesus is saying here to Nicodemus is that you must be born again. You must be baptized. Because baptism, it's not that we're just going out swimming. A lot of times people say, oh yeah, you're a Lutheran. And so you think that you're saved through baptism. What do you think we do? That Lutherans were going out swimming? Is that what baptism is all about? Or is there something more to it than that? Well, this is where I read what the Apostle Paul has to say about it. From Romans chapter 6, verse 3 through 7. Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. If we have been united with him like him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. For we know that our old self was crucified with him, 
so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin, because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. And so here again, well, you Lutherans, what do you do? Do you just go out swimming? No, as we hear, baptism is being that we are united with Christ's death, his burial, and his resurrection. In other words, what the Apostle Paul is saying, if you want to receive the salvation life of Christ, you receive Jesus Christ as you have been baptized. And so if they still want to say that we go out swimming, well, okay, I'll swim with the Lord, but knowing that I'm swimming in the waters of salvation. And then also Holy Communion. As we read in John, or excuse me, yeah, John chapter 6, uh, verse 25. John chapter 6, verse 35. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Jesus, he fed over 5,000 people and he ate the Passover meal. And as he ate the Passover meal, he now has put the Passover meal on a whole new level. And so as we read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through uh, 25, we hear what Jesus has to say as he, was, as he is experiencing the Passover meal with his disciples. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. And so Jesus being the bread of life, what he is saying here is that as you receive this bread, as you receive this wine, that you are receiving my body and my blood. You are receiving my salvation life that I have given and shed upon the cross. Salvation life has come to you in hearing the word, being baptized, and also receiving Holy Communion, Jesus' precious body and blood, the means of grace. Those who make a donation to KFXB of $25 or more will receive a copy of Pastor Peterson's latest book, Christmas Ponderings. 